This is a Now Magazine podcast. Hey, Toronto, and welcome to Now What? I'm Norm Wilner, senior film writer for Now Magazine, and I'm also your host for this podcast, coming to you every Friday with the news and culture stories we think you need to hear. You might have seen some coverage about the trucker convoy that came to Ottawa last weekend. Actually, scratch that, you definitely saw something because it was everywhere, initially for its participants' opposition to the cross-border vaccine mandate, and then as it descended into a rage fest directed at Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and the government in general, with flags both Confederate and Nazi on display. In fact, the media coverage was so enthusiastic that you might not even have noticed the two other assemblages in Toronto that weekend, arguably airing more legitimate grievances. It felt like we should correct that imbalance, so for this episode, we reached out to Ahmed Jarrar of the GTA Palestinian Movement and Miskwasan Agnew of the Salt River First Nation to talk about their respective events last Saturday and Sunday. Miskwasan Nindijnikas, Mangan Nindodam, Bramden Nindinjava, Mishkigo Indane Indalam. I just said that my name is Redstone Woman, and I'm from the Wolf Clan. I currently live on Treaty 19 territory here in Brampton. And uh, I'm Cree and I'm Dene and uh, just living here in in the Shinabe territory. <laughs> I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. My name is uh, Ahmed Jarrar, and I am a Palestinian uh, activist here in based in the GTA. And I am one of the founders and organizers at GPM.21, which is a dedicated community um, uh, or grassroots movement uh, focused on amplifying oppressed voices. Uh, We aim to facilitate freedom and justice for Palestinians through strategic action. And thanks a lot for having us. Not at all. Uh, And the reason we are talking today is because both of your organizations held protests in Toronto on the streets. And unless people were paying particularly close attention or they looked at the Now website, they might not have known that was happening at all because all the media attention was focused on truckers in Ottawa. Well, I, I'm trying to, I've been trying to figure out, and I apologize, I've been trying to figure out where to start uh, my way into this because it does feel like this weekend was all about a white supremacy tailgating party that had been hyped up by right-wing media and Facebook, and it's just an example of the misinformation and disinformation that's flying around. Meanwhile, I don't think anyone could argue that the two of you represent groups with legitimate grievances against the state of things in Canada and the world right now, objectively speaking. So uh, first question, I suppose, is how did it go? Um, Not in terms of the response to the protests, we'll get to that, but how did your respective Saturday and Sunday events go? So on Saturday, um, January 29th of 2022, we were able to unite with different organizations in Toronto um, to actually pull this emergency rally. The reason is why we decided to hit the streets is because we were answering to an emergency call from Palestine itself. Uh, amid the escalations that are happening right now. So we had to focus on the messaging of why we wanted to be out there, despite the fact that it was negative 25 degrees. Um, What is happening right now in Palestine is there is a lot of attention going on in Al-Naqab, or known as Negev. Um, There is forced evictions, um, and by all means, true means of Um, ethnic cleansing at its finest taking place in front of our eyes and also with what is happening in Sheikh Jarrah which is also a neighborhood that is suffering from forced evictions Um, so we decided to um, hit the streets in Toronto to um, go to the Israeli consulate and make enough noise Um, and that uh, was a successful event due to the fact of its relevancy Um, what was happening was um, we had to answer an international call from people in Palestine, and we decided to mobilize urgently um, for for all of us to actually be out there in the streets. Um, It was successful because we were able to unite with all the uh, pro-Palestinian organizations here in Toronto, uh, in addition to the support, the tremendous support we get from our allies uh, from the indigenous community, as well as, for example, the Anakbayan Filipino kind of solidarity movement, 
uh, as well as uh, independent Jewish voices and so forth. Um, what was unique about Saturday that it was negative 25 degrees, but we truly believe that the Palestinians live day to day through their struggles and the weather is not something they consider. So therefore the weather here is something that we will not consider. And how did it go? Um, what was the response like? Uh, I, I know there was a police presence, but it looks like everything went peacefully. And as far as media coverage, uh, did anyone else show up besides Toronto's now uh, team? Right. So in terms of media coverage, unfortunately, we end up relying on a lot of our local um, kind of news uh, outlets or mm -hmm. media outlets versus uh, the big uh, media outlets out there. Uh, the known ones, um, but we decided and we have figured out that throughout our protests, anything that has to do with Palestine is heavily oppressed in the media or censored. Um, given the fact that we realized um, all these big media outlets, uh, if I'm allowed to mention some names such as uh, CTV or CBC and so forth, um, they're all owned by the same Zionist entity. So therefore, uh, the word Palestine terrifies them. Um, so we have learned that we rely on the international reach. So we have a very good connection to um, uh, media outlets uh, that are currently existing in Palestine, that we were able to gain some international traction from there. Uh, although, Anything that is local, um, we did not get any sort of attention, but that is something that we are used to and we actually made peace with in a sense is because we have our own kind of strategies and ways to uh, do enough voice to be able to be heard. Thankfully, now Toronto was actually there and they were able to publish an article um, that really went a very long way such as I believe the Dark Courser made another article. Uh, there are several other local or, um, media outlets that were able to cover what happened. Although we, I, we did feel like the fact that we did not get these media outlets to come and cover our grand protest is something that we have expected, something that we have gotten used to because that's how it has been uh, throughout all our Palestinian protests. Um, so, with that, I believe, uh, in a sense, we expected it, although we had our, our own means and methods to kind of um, proceed with sending our voice internationally. Um, our given protest on Saturday was one of the largest uh, emergency call, um, an answer to this emergency call um, around the world. So it was actually crucial to uh, get it covered through as many media outlets as we possibly can. Although we reached a point where we knew that people are the media, people using their own social media accounts and, and so forth, that is the power of the people. And I believe that's something to not be underestimated. And I believe through that, we're able to make our voices go far. But of course, having an official large um, media outlet to cover what we were doing, of course, we would have gained a much greater traction. Ms. Kwasin, the protest on Sunday was at Young and Dundas, which, as it turns out, is just you know, like one major street south of where the Palestinian protest was on Saturday. Uh, and how did that go? That was more of a vigil, I understand. It was, it was less of a march and more of an occupation of space and, and, and attention. Yeah, I wouldn't um, have labeled it a protest. Um, we called it a memorial um, gathering in March. Mm -hmm. um, from the 93 uh, remains of the children that were found in Williams Lake First Nations, uh, St. Joseph's Residential School was the name of the school that they were found. They were found on January 25th, 2022. Um, that was phase one of the search at St. Joseph's Residential School. They searched 90 hectares. They still have 470 hectares left to search. So we know that this is only um, the beginning um, and that there are more remains to be found. Um, and so we thought it was really important to 
memorialize um, not only them, but um, all the children that have been found um, and for our relatives who survived residential school as well, it's really important to understand um, the harm um, and intergenerational trauma that exists within our communities because of that. It, you know, it's not only do our elders um, have to carry that burden, but it's our entire community. It echoes throughout the generations. And so um, I think the significance uh, more so of Young Dundas Square, we've been calling it Landback Square. Uh, myself, as well as other organizers, we don't belong to any uh, organization per se. We're just coming together as a community, um, a group of indigenous people trying to reclaim that space and that territory. That territory uh, traditionally belongs to the Mississaugas of the uh, Credit First Nation. And we have been working to uh, do consultations with them um, and not necessarily the band uh, chief and council. Um, that's actually a colonial um, governance that was forced upon our people. So we're looking to consult with the traditional um, hereditary chiefs, which is actually law according to the United Nations. Um, and we call it UNDRIP, which is the United Nations Declarations of the Rights of Indigenous People. And so we're looking to consult with them and their community, the elders there, to rename that, uh, that square, Young Dundas Square. Um, and fortunately, we've been able to make connections with folks um, who have been successful in that renaming process. Um, but Ryerson, uh, formerly known Ryerson, ex-university, mm -hmm. uh, was a block away. And um, as you know, um, Egerton Ryerson, he was um, one of the perpetrators of, you know, making um, residential school happen in Canada. Um, and, and it was really important to me that as folks were walking by, they saw the candles and the bears on the steps and they were reminded of the children being found. Um, I think that uh, the media has certainly sensationalized what's currently happening in Ottawa. And I think that it's dangerous and it's harmful to communities that have been out there on the front lines um, for years. Um, I know um, friends of mine personally have been criminalized for um, fighting, you know, protecting their own traditional territory um, and the criminalization of land defenders in Canada um, in uh, comparison to um, the behavior that's being allowed to happen in Ottawa is um, a clear um, example of how um, what's good for uh, First Nations people does not necessarily apply to all Canadians. And so we're seeing a, a direct example of that, um, you know, how we're being pleated, treated as second class citizens. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a shame that um, when I turned on the radio and I was actually, I was listening to 680 News and they had mentioned the convoy in Ottawa um, they had mentioned something about sports and they had mentioned the weather and that was it. 93 children were tortured and abused and put in unmarked mass graves in this country. And we're more concerned about the sports and the weather and this uh, convoy that's being uh, led by white supremacists and people uh, every day, average Canadians are sympathizing with them. Um, it's it's a very dangerous time, and um, it, it's certainly um, harmful for the Indigenous community to see that. And in terms of how, it's, it's certainly our culture was appropriated during these rallies in Ottawa as well. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen um, the video circling um, the web right now, um, the appropriation that happened, um, and there was even um, stolen drums from our communities identified there. Um, so it's it's been just um, really awful to not only grieve um, our lost ones, but then to have the added layer of um, I don't I don't know what you would call it. Yeah, it's been it. It was really sad 
to um, see that happen over the weekend. But we did have, um, I would say about 75 people max at one point. Um, but the people that came, um, you know, I have to express my gratitude to them because we were able to at least provide a space for um, some members of our Indigenous community. You know, people got an opportunity to do that. The metaphor I keep coming back to is the convoy is actually managing to shout down your the two of your protests. It, it's their larger objective is that they want to position themselves at the center of whatever's going on. Their, their demands as expressed are that the government resigns and they appoint ministers that they like, which makes no sense and will not happen and, and is sort of magical thinking on its own. But the rush of media coverage to put them front and center, yes, on one level, I understand the news bureaus have cameras there. It's the, it's the capital of the country. It's This is an event. But 10,000 people without an actual grievance versus people standing up for something legitimate, um, it may be smaller numbers, but the cause can be verified and explained. And it feels like a failure of, of nerve on the part of these news organizations uh, when they chase the big noisy thing that everyone else is talking about on Facebook, because that's where they think the eyeballs are. Um, uh, um, you, you mentioned the resistance uh, from legacy media. And I kind of want to ask which, like, if, Bell, if CTV is owned by a Zionist entity, does that mean Bell Media is a Zionist entity? And how does that work? Or is it a larger metaphor? Right. I believe it's a, it's a larger metaphor. I have to, you know, check my facts in terms of exactly who owns who. But overall, um, we have just realized over the time is that um, the media, the big media entities are pretty much owned by the same kind of organizations that push for the same sort of agenda or the same sort of narrative. And that's something that we have felt through our own experiences protesting here in Toronto. So it's uh, based on um, the actions that we do here and what we have reciprocated here locally. So it was this, this knowledge is based on our own given actions. So initially when we are to do these protests and, and we go out there, um, we we actually have a fact by fact now that no no media coverage is going to come cover what we're doing, um, but the last time they've actually covered uh, what happened with us or what what we actually did in the streets of Toronto was back in May, when we had that large protest. We had I believe around twenty thousand people that showed up at Nathan Phillips Square, uh, and then they felt like they were they had to cover that but more so is because there was a fight that took place right after so and with all the media headlines taking place prior to investigating what actually happened uh, that gave us sort of an idea of what our local media outlets uh, actually focus on so um, also at the same given time I believe back in May um, a, a big NGO which is Human Rights Watch have actually uh, made an announcement about uh, uh, about uh, Israel as a country and its doings as as an apartheid state. Um, at the same given day, um, they were actually broadcasting the fact that Obama's dog died. So obviously their priorities uh, are are different. So we got to learn and realize that we don't really care about these big media platforms because we are the media. Social media is a new thing. Uh, and, and we are the ones who can actually um, hit the streets on, uh, that's why we, we decided to hit the streets on, on a weekly basis. So we can actually have this straight element that we can actually meet the people themselves or we can do this, this, this awareness, spreading awareness on a personal, on a personal level. So we go on bridges and we do banner drops or we organize marches or, or rallies uh, to tell the people exactly what's actually going on. Um, to tie it into something that is more relevant, that is now, Amnesty International has made a recent announcement uh, of Israel's doings, um, as well as Human Rights Watch, as well as Beth uh, Slim. Uh, so these are big international organizations that are making these official statements now, but the difference is, if you Google it right now, 
CTV, CBC have covered these statements now, which they haven't covered previously. And what I can say to that is because I would, you know, looking into light, I would rather say, because when we were back in May, we consistently tried to target media censorship in our action. Um, whether it was at UFT when Dr. Arazova uh, was actually um, uh, let go of her position due to her views on, on, on Palestine, um, we actually went as a community to stand with her and to stand with the whole cause and to fight um, uh, Palestinian censorship, perhaps, in, uh, in the UFT as a whole, as an organization, as well as CBC. Um, has made a statement when things were more trending or when things were more relevant back then in May. Uh, CBC has made a statement uh, that said that we do not recognize Palestine as a state. So that has actually fired up a lot of our local community and wanted to um, actually do something about that. So we have organized a protest right outside CBC's office headquarters here in Toronto on Front Street. Um, and we made sure they heard our demands and we made sure that uh, they have seen that there is local pressure from our community. That has created a ripple effect throughout Vancouver, Ottawa, and Montreal uh, to do the exact same thing. Um, we have gotten word as well that also uh, employees from CBC and so forth also pressure their own companies uh, to speak about this is because these employees are seeing that uh, this topic is still trending, the pressure on the streets is still going. Why are we not covering something like this? So there is even pressure from within that I believe when you add and tally all these things up together, that they cannot turn the blind eye onto what's actually happening right now. So just that when Amnesty International today makes a statement, they are covering it. So I could look at it in, in terms of light that you know, our pressures, our consistent pressures are making a difference and uh, we are seeing some sort of result. So it's not that the Ottawa protest was an excuse not to cover your protest. You simply weren't expecting them to cover your protest to begin with. Yes, I, I, I truly believe what is happening in Ottawa. Yes, it's taking the vast amount of attention at that given moment is because of their vast numbers and uh, uh, perhaps what what they're calling for. Now, uh, to relate to what we do compared to what is happening in Ottawa right now, we are an organization that are doing things differently that other organizations haven't really done. We're not afraid to push the limit, although we are well aware of our limits. So we don't cross the lines, meaning we don't really do any sort of um, public nuisance or sort of uh, civil disobedience, although we're not afraid to actually voice out in ways that others haven't. So when we protest and hit the streets, uh, there is the sort of game that you have to play in Canada in order to be heard, in order to get your uh, voices heard. Now, if pro-Palestinian uh, protesters were uh, jumping on these relics and historical monuments, then that would have backfired big time. Uh, and at the same time, we respect uh, the given um, rules or the given allowances that the government of Canada has even given us to actually advocate and voice out. It's because I myself have a lot of family members that live abroad that do not have the right to speak up or they can actually be serving 20 plus years under administrative detention just for simply raising the flag. So us as Canadians here have to be thankful for the fact that we are given this opportunity to voice out, that we are given this platform. And as Canadians, we are practicing our, uh, under chapter two of the Charter of Freedom of Rights, which talks about uh, you know freedom of expression and belief. And we are, you know, taking full advantage of this right, but at the same time, advocating correctly. We are respecting the given rules, but we're not afraid to push the limit. There's a knock-on effect of the demonstration in Ottawa where people who would rather not have to think about the things that both of your groups are raising are feeling more empowered to shout you down. Uh, and, I, and I wanted to ask about the, the sort of 
political temperature on Sunday, uh, Ms. Quasson, was, was it, um, was it, how did people respond to the vigil? Was there a sense that, that the energy in the area, I mean, I've, I've spent enough time at Young and Dundas to know that it can be a magnet for people who just want to shout at anyone who's making a stand for something. Um, the photographs look like it was peaceful and respectful, but I, I wasn't there. So I'd like to know how that went. And if you're feeling, you know, these, these revelations of, um, or sorry, the discoveries of, of grave sites have been happening with a really distressing regularity since last spring. And uh, what is, what's the public response like now? Are, um, people are shouting that they're tired of everything. Are they tired of this as well? Um, I would certainly hope that Canadians aren't tired of hearing about the, you know, mass graves of children. Of course. Um, I would also like to make comment that um, while um, we, I certainly exercise the right to protest myself, I would, you know, like to point out that Indigenous land defenders who are out there, quote unquote, protesting, protecting their land, protecting the water and the earth for all of us to live are being met with attack dogs and tear gas and and assault, you know, rubber bullets. And, and it's it's certainly um, they don't get the right to protest that others do. Um, so there are certainly people in this country who can protest and others who cannot. Um, and it's also, um, you know, horrible that we can't do that our, on our own unceded territory. Um, it, it, we're, we're not blocking uh, streets in Ottawa right now. Um, and, but, you know, it's interesting that when um, Indigenous land defenders are blocking down highways, um, you know, we are, um, uh, myself uh, personally, as a, a you know, um, land defender and, and indigenous activist. Um, I've been called racial slurs for um, shutting down traffic and, and um, you know, verbally assaulted, not only by passersby, but the police as well. Um, we've seen in Ottawa how the police were, um, you know, very friendly with people taking selfies with folks, yeah. um, sending folks hot meals. Um, that certainly does not happen um, with us as the Indigenous community with the Toronto Police Services. Um, in fact, one of um, what they do now is they will not make an arrest um, during the event, they will wait until we're all separated and then they will arrest us then. And one of our um, warriors was arrested on the TTC going home on Sunday night for something that occurred several months ago. Um, so, and it's, it's clear to see that um, the police are targeting um, Indigenous activists for their um, protesting. And, and I want, you know, I would hope that, um, Um, we're, we're all learning from what's happening in Ottawa right now and the people who aren't there to support uh, white supremacy, as they say, um, you know, and, and that they quote unquote support Indigenous communities. I hope that they're now going to be on the front lines with us um, going forward. Um, yeah, there was a... Uh... A distressing silence from the. I, I, you can you can argue until you're blue in the face that there is no intention, right? But the second a Nazi flag comes out and other people don't pull it down, I think that's kind of the giveaway. I, I know that there is supposedly another protest planned for Toronto on Saturday, and um, I hope you guys are safe. I hope everything's okay because I would love to I hate it when any group puts me in the position to say boy I hope the police crack down on these people but it's just um it feels like they're not going to and Mayor Tory's statement uh this morning that he hopes everyone will be their best selves and behave that's what he says all the time and then nothing happens and then the worst people are enabled well, I was going to write a story about I was going to write an, an op-ed about this the paper this week but we all decided it was too depressing um so uh, with, I'm trying to figure out how to end this well, but uh, if there are any, you know, if you have, um, in in the three minutes we have left, uh, what is, what's your, what's the one thing you hope comes of the last weekend? Um, Ahmed, we can start with you. Um, what I would say is 
we hope that our energy and our dedication and our efforts can actually unite movements. I could only imagine how if, if all these communities, all these movements collaboratively actually believed and focused on these given causes and we all dedicated certain days to go out there and advocate. Canada stands very powerful in the world for advocating for human rights. And let's let's put Canada where it is and let's and let's you know put their name out there. And, and I believe if we collaborate all together, we can definitely go a very long way. Okay, thank you. Uh, and, and Ms. Kwasan, your, your ideal um, takeaway? Um, I would certainly like to acknowledge that um, it wasn't just the Indigenous community that um, came to the vigil on Sunday. Um, we certainly had allies from um, many uh, different organizations and um, members of our community. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that going forward, as more um, searches are conducted, um, people don't forget about um, our children. And um, I would also like people to know that um, while the federal government has agreed to fund the search of these mass graves, they have not agreed to fund the investigation. Um, and, and folks aren't aware of that. Um, and also, they have not agreed to pay for the cost of security of these um, grave sites. Um, and so you, what we're seeing is Mumbu patrol of um, uh, these investigation sites themselves. Um, and so I, I hope that going forward, we continue to create a space for Indigenous community and others alike to um, respectfully grieve these children and, and are given that space and time. Thanks to Ms. Kwasin and Ahmed for joining me for this episode. Thanks also to now photographer Nick Lachance for pulling it all together. You can find Nick's coverage of both events at nowtoronto.com slash news. Now What will be back next Friday. Until then, keep an eye on nowtoronto.com for news and culture as it happens, and email us at web at nowtoronto.com with questions or comments. Wear a mask, keep your distance, and please get your booster. It's going to be weird in Toronto this weekend. Please be safe. I'll see you soon.